Ernie, I happen to know, among other things, that you teach a course or have taught one on evolutionary ethics. That's a very interesting phrase to begin with, evolutionary ethics. And uh, as soon as you start talking ethics, you're partly into my world there, the religious theological world. And uh, so I'm hoping we can have a little dialogue about that and uh, see what that phrase might mean, uh, who's used it, um, what it's all about, and then I'm going to attack it. (laughs) <laughs> and tear it to shreds. Uh, that's my plan for this program. I don't know about about you, but you d- you have taught a course like that, not so. Right, it's a seminar, but I I realize that it's not my area, which is why it was jointly taught with uh, <laughs> my colleague, who's the chairman of the Department of Philosophy. <laughs> and Charlie Blatz, we should have Charlie here, right? Definitely, to, uh, yeah. <laughs> it's an unfair uh, discussion without having him here. But I know that's an interest of yours, and uh, you drew me into it somewhat by. Um, you, in connection with your seminar, I believe, brought in a, a Professor Michael Roos. He wrote a book called Taking Darwin Seriously. That's a nice title, and where he developed some thoughts on evolutionary ethics. I've read that book. You've read it. We've both heard him lecture. So maybe we can find some common ground for talking about this topic of evolutionary ethics. Um, you want to say a little bit about your own sense of what that's about? Uh, and let's uh, gradually refine it. I think the 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 topic itself uh, reflects the idea that uh, as we understand human evolution and the evolution of human behavior, uh, we see that uh, our biological background, our biological basis, and how we got to be what we are, uh, does have some implications on understanding human behavior and perhaps even how humans ought to behave. Um, so the idea is that being animals uh, with an evolutionary past, we would, we might be able to, the philosophers and the theologians, or perhaps the philosophers only, might be able to get uh, a little better idea of, of building their ethical system if they were to be aware of our biological past, or as Roos's title says, if they were to really take evolution or Darwin seriously. Um, there are a number of philosophers uh, who uh, attempt to do this, attempt to incorporate man's evolutionary background into ethical systems. Uh, Similarly, there are a number of uh, biologists who uh, rush in where angels fear to tread and uh, attempt to build their own ethical systems uh, out of their biological background. So you mentioned uh, Darwin. That takes us back to 1859 and his pioneering work, The Origin of the Species, can you just uh, tell me a little bit about that book and uh, you know how he derived it, his studies that, that led him to that? We can't spend a lot of time on that, but I think it's a sort of fascinating kind of story. Uh, the Origin of Species uh, had its uh, roots, it seems, in uh, Darwin's uh, long interest on trying to understand where the diversity in human life came from. Uh, he was exposed in the late 1830s uh, to the world outside of England on a trip, a three-year trip around the world uh, in which he <coughs> saw uh, a variety in the living world that uh, uh, posed an enormous number of problems to him. And he visited certain places that were especially helpful yes, to him. Yes, he, he, would, he, he, would, uh, he sailed from, from England. Uh, the Canary Islands were extremely valuable. Uh, the, the both coasts of South America were extremely valuable. Uh, it posed a lot of problems. Uh, the Galapagos Islands off of Ecuador uh, posed a number especially of problems. Especially important to him, weren't they? Yeah. They they were very much so, especially in comparison with uh, the, the Canaries, that he, or Cape Verde Islands off of Africa, mm-hmm. uh, because uh, there he saw islands that were very, very similar, one in the Atlantic and one in the Pacific, uh, but where they were populated by quite different animals. The animals and plants had relationships to the nearby continents and not to where they ought to be. And just a number of, of uh, mm-hmm. problems came up. At the same time, I might mention, they spent a lot of time in southern uh, South America, and uh, he dwells a lot on the inhabitants of Tierra del Fuego, uh, who undoubtedly had uh, a, a big influence on uh, influencing his thinking with respect to human behavior as well. He came back and spent... Uh, what especially struck him about those uh, people? Uh, what, is, what struck him was with the, uh, the imperial uh, British mindset he had, they were considered savages. Nevertheless, 
um, he, uh, he so to his mind he saw their behavior uh, rather intermediate between uh, some behavior of uh, animals such as apes and baboons and humans uh, so they seem to be part of a gradation mm -hmm. uh, that wasn't the case began, but yes, but, but it, it got him thinking that behavior could yeah. also work the same way as physical traits as well yeah. yes uh, and it set up this whole uh, evolutionary uh, scheme in his mind that uh, we are uh, developing or mm -hmm. we through this process of uh, random natural well this selection. posed a lot of posed a lot no. of questions to him uh, the other two major influences of being a british gentleman he was well aware of uh, uh, animal breeding and artificial selection on the farms mm -hmm. that gave him a mechanism to build on and mm -hmm. his readings of thomas malthus uh, the uh, continental uh, sociologist at the time uh, pointed out the idea that populations would continue to grow unless there was some sort of um, what he later called selection uh, mm -hmm. for or against. So a number of factors come into play, but what is uh, absolutely clear is that Darwin has become a major influence on modern thought. He's influenced the uh, world of biology, obviously, but he's also inter uh, influenced the world of theology, the whole religious understanding, forced a rethinking of God, uh, given us a sense of the development of doctrine and and in a number of ways has uh, forced us to try to understand Christianity within an evolutionary framework, including the moral questions. Uh, and I, I think that comes into play. So we're back to this question of evolutionary ethics and, and what that's all about. So I guess uh, primarily what the people in this field say is that uh, our bi biology has an effect on our behavior, I believe. Yes. Yeah. And that is... Uh, we can maybe talk a little bit about how that might happen. I mean, here's my reading. One of the famous sociobiologists is Edward O. Wilson, right, a Harvard professor. He himself was influential on uh, Michael Roos, whose book we were talking about, Taking Darwin Seriously. Um, I think uh, Roos calls uh, Wilson a friend and a critic as well, and he disagrees with him in some ways. But let me tell you my layman's understanding of that, and then you can maybe comment on that. But I, I get a sense that uh, Wilson says this, that, that our um, emotions are controlled biologically, and uh, the hypothalamus and, and so on, uh, that that controls um, a, a lot of our um, just strong innate reactions to things, and those emotional reactions in turn um, end up dictating much of our behavior. And that uh, a lot of the behavior then becomes, in Wilson's mind, uh, programmed in what, I don't know if this is the right word, but a selfish direction. I think he even said that in some places, uh, a selfish direction. In other words, what we're out to do is to preserve ourselves or uh, perver preserve the species, maybe. I don't know if that's too or, broad for or, him or, or not. That, that may be too broad, perhaps, yeah. just to propagate ourselves. To propagate well. ourselves, yeah. Right. Individually. Yeah. So that, uh, what comes out of this, I suppose, is, uh, in my mind, at least my reading of Wilson, who's a very influential figure, is you get a kind of determinism, a, a naturalism, a, a biological determinism, so that we must respond to particular situations in particular ways. I think it ends up doing away with human freedom, and suggests that ethical behavior really has a sort of a selfish dimension to it, I guess. And that all of that somehow works out to keep the species alive. That's a layman's understanding of Wilson. Now, you want to try to fill that in or correct it or do something with it? Well, I think, I think Wilson and other sociobiologists would, would uh, uh, not necessarily, well, th there'd be a wide variety of, of just how deterministic the behavior would be. Uh, but I think they would all agree that, that uh, certain types of behavior, uh, there are biological tendencies. Do you, do you want to say, though, that you want to take, go away from uh, saying Wilson is a determinist? Do you think no, he's I not? Think, I, th I, think he, I, think, I think he may be in more in, in the more deterministic area. Yeah. Of the okay, that's my reading, yeah. that Michael Roos, uh, who is a critic of Wilson as well as a friend, opens up greater room for freedom yes. in my mind. Yes, yeah, and, and other... People delving in the area of evolutionary ethics will will uh, uh, have uh, uh, more and more room for uh, what you may want to call freedom, um, and they are, But they all would admit that there and 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 have as a basis for their thinking that there is at least 
some sort of biologically determined tendency or biologically controlled uh, mm -hmm. tendencies for certain kinds of behaviors, uh, some deep tendencies. Do you happen to know how Roos understands the word epigenetic? Is that an important word? I mean, it's a technical word for him. Well, Are you it, able to say what that in, in some intelligible language what that word means? It, it means a, uh, uh, let's see, a, he talks about epigenetic rules. These are yeah. rules of development or rules of, of uh, they're uh, biologically based rules that control the way the, we develop. That's right, yes. Yeah. Epigenesis is a technical yeah. term for how an organism develops yeah, in yeah. the embryo. Right. So they're developmental rules, how, how the, the brain structures itself. Or well, how of course, I, and I think that uh, these people would generally say that that has been random, that part of that whole process has a randomness about it, that but it ends up being like we are now. Right, I mean. that, the or, that the origin of those rules comes about, that need not have come about, the right. rules need not have appeared, the mechanism, uh, for example, for us to develop five fingers need not have appeared, but it wasn't totally random because we did involve from an organism that had two forelimbs, so therefore uh, you're, you're not going to have uh, uh, 12 arms appear. Right. Uh, it, it, this links us in, of course, uh, in some ways with the, the animal population. Of course, if we have indeed derived from animals and uh, uh, through the evolutionary process, then that's not surprising. But uh, I, I remember an example from uh, that Roos used, and I don't know if this was, I remember it orally, or he told me, or I read it in his book, but it's something like this. An uh, 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 observer of the chimpanzees, uh, sees the two two young chimpanzees fighting, and uh, the mother is sitting there and observing this. And the mother, at some point, um, through some signal to the grandmother, who's also there, then um, the uh, signals the grandmother. The grandmother at then at that point intervenes in this fight, and they quit fighting. I mean, I don't really remember how she intervenes exactly, but she does something along this line. And, uh, you know, I took it to be an example of, um, so, well, uh, uh, what do I want to say, a primitive animal-like behavior that seems to have an ethical dimension to it. In other words, a grandmother is brought in to, to stop the fight, which, you know, evidently is not uh, acceptable behavior in certain circumstances in that chimpanzee community. Now, I, I don't know what that means, uh, except, I guess, this linkage that we end up saying that there's somehow these epigenetic rules or this, uh, in the biological process or evolutionary process, there's certain ways in which we, our, our behavior gets programmed to save the species, I suppose, or to, to make sure that the, the collectivity continues to function. Yeah, natural selection, uh, the mechanism of natural selection, I think, would say that if... Uh, uh, if there are certain types of behaviors that are for the, for the benefit of the of the organism, or uh, perhaps even a, a small group of kin, uh, they would be uh, selected for, and any behaviors that would be to the to the detriment, whereas they may pop up now and then, uh, would be selected against, and you would not see uh, large groups of organisms that would have you know, that would exhibit throughout the population behaviors that were detrimental to the species. Yes. So you, you would see my, the example that I'm recalling from Roos uh, is uh, bringing that out. Possibly, yes. Yes, uh-huh. Well, okay, so is there anything else about animal behavior that seems to be instructive here? I'm always le leery of that. You know, I'm always leery when psychologists want to base everything they want to say on the study of rats or something. Mm -hmm. As someone once said to me, B.F. Skinner was great if you happen to be a pigeon. And, you know, I'm always uh, leery of, of this si sort of uh, study, I suppose, from my own theological viewpoint. But on the other hand, I well recognize we are rooted in the animal world. We're rooted in the material world. So is there anything else from the world, the animal world, that seems instructive in all this to you? Well, I, I think if, if one looks at uh, animal behavior, we can find, our sociobiologists seem to be able to identify uh, certain types of behavior patterns uh, that uh, they can see popping up over ag again and again uh, within uh, 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 groups of animals and uh, these behavior patterns have to be happen to be carrying out types of behaviors that that may be detrimental for the individual but in the long run are beneficial for for the for the relatives mm -hmm. um, and 
initially evolutionary thought would, would say this shouldn't be, there should not be a, a type of behavior that would be detrimental to the individual. Uh, and the other thing is that uh, one can see animals that, uh, that apparently uh, at, at times will in fact uh, behave beneficially towards non-relatives. Um, and uh, this is the, the idea of, of reciprocal altruism. They will then get, uh, as long as the organism they behave, or the other member of their species they behave well to, behaves well back to them, they will uh, carry on a type of uh, uh, reciprocal, doing good things for each other. I think that Roos uh, takes this and, and applies it uh, to the human realm. I mean, part of his uh, biological rules, it seems to me, uh, have to do with... Uh, that we do things that will uh, somehow propagate our genes, as he says, but then somehow also that, that, that benefits the larger community. I mean, uh, for ex he uses uh, the example, I think, of saying that, well, um, what happens is that we are sexually attracted to members outside of our family, uh, but we're not sexually attracted to siblings. And therefore, that ends up being very good for the species because if we were sexually attracted to, to siblings, then we would uh, end up uh, inbreeding and it would hurt the, the human race. So I, I think that isn't that one, of the, in other words, there'd be an ethical principle or an ethical type of behavior, I suppose, that comes out of our, our biology here, that we, uh, our biology moves us uh, to avoid incest. Yes, yeah, this, this, is, this is probably one of the most... Uh, uh, talked about and, and uh, widely discussed aspects of, of sociobiology, the so-called incest taboo. Um, it, it does seem that uh, uh, within humans and other uh, other animals, uh, you look at there's there's very very strong tendency where uh, not to engage in in, in close brother sister mating or close matings. Uh, and the question has to come about if, especially when you're talking about humans. Uh, if in fact there is freedom, uh, why why does this not take place? And the sociobiologists uh, suggest that uh, somehow deep in our uh, brain programs, uh, there is a, uh, uh, a a type of behavior that is inherited uh, that uh, does in fact uh, reduce the odds tremendously that siblings that are, or, or youngsters that are children that are raised together uh, will not, uh, for the most part, have sexual interest in each other. Mm -hmm. One can then see how this could benefit the, 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 the species as a whole or the small group that they're in also. Mm -hmm. uh, let me take you back to Edward Wilson and this, uh, what I was portraying as sort of a selfishness ethic. And um, what, what do you want to say about that? I mean, do you, do you end up agreeing with that? Do you want to critique it? Uh, um, how do you understand it? I think that uh, uh, Wilson, I'm not all that sure that Wilson himself is really putting out uh, an ethic and would, would want to be uh, tied into being an, an, an uh, uh, an ethician. Yeah, or part uh, of these evolutionary ethics. I think, I think he, he, on his own, he has come to his own view of, of how human behavior comes about, and that's not necessarily uh, saying that ethics, this is the way it ought to be, but... It's uh, just the way it is. It's almost it's just, just a the description way it of that's the human right. scene. I, I would say that's that as right. soon as you deny freedom and move into a total determinism, you don't have ethics anyway. Yeah. I mean, to me, ethics is necessarily tied in with uh, culpability or uh, praiseworthy behavior. In other words, only uh, only way I can understand ethics is if there's choices connected with it. And I mean, otherwise, I think all you're doing is describing the human scene, how people necessarily have to act. Yes, yeah, and 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 perhaps Wilson is one of the stronger determinists uh, yeah. uh, in in the area. I don't think Roos is quite that determinist. Okay, well, let's get to Roos then. And how are we going to say Roos is a ethic? Uh, what is the word? A moralist <laughs> <laughs> that he does ethics. I I think he uh, he he approaches it in two way or. or approaches two aspects. First of all, what ought we to do? Uh, and um, in, in this sense, he, he really does not uh, differ too awfully much from, from general 
uh, ethical trend, be nice, be fair to, to one another. Uh, although he derives why we ought to be that way from biological principles, from the idea of kin selection or reciprocal altruism, that, that we ought to do that, uh, or that we, that, that you know, this is, uh, uh, this is the, the, the ethical norms that we should, we should carry out because uh, in the long run it's best for the species, it's best for the, for the individuals if you're nice and you're fair because other people will be nice to you or because you're being nice and, and uh, increasing the odds that your, your relatives will propagate if not you. Um, he then says if that's the case, if, if some of this is, is, is deep in our, our biology, uh, how do we bring in the idea of ought? Um, why ought we to do it? And uh, in this sense, uh, in his answer to that, I think, uh, is to my mind what sets him apart from, from most of the other uh, ethical thinkers in this area and, and I tend to think really opens him up to his theory up to some good scientific study and essentially he says well the only reason is that we ought to do it is because our brain has evolved uh, and the illusion that we ought to. Uh, because if we reflect on any idea um, we can see that uh, uh, we can't see any any reason why we ought to do it, but uh, he says that we've evolved this other brain mechanism, which is an illusion of of ought. I must say I don't I, I find that some of the more, the more troubling parts of his theory. I, I mean I know it, it, it's it's almost as though that somehow the species has manufactured this illusion that we yeah, ought to yeah, do it. This is yeah, that's I what I he's saying. I mean. Bec but to force because us there's to some do sort it. of ad adaptive advantage, I presume. Yes, there's an adaptive advantage to doing things this way, but this is, he said, this is what is. This is what has evolved. There is an adaptive advantage to that, but that doesn't necessarily mean that we ought to do it, that you or I as individuals ought to do it. Uh, what difference does it make to us what the future of the species happens to be? Um, so but his, his in, order to yeah, get, yeah. Uh, in order to get an organism that can now reflect on potential variables on what would happen if I do or if I don't. I mean, with our mind, with the ability to reflect and, and to, to, to construct alternate scenarios, uh, in order to get us to, be, to move in this direction, we're not hardwired, we're not totally deterministic, but in order to get us to move and do things that are in fact uh, somewhat beneficial, something else had to appear on the scene. And what he says is then the illusion of, of ought uh, is the is the forcing factor that had to evolve? You know, I, I I'm of course very critical of that. I was publicly when I mm -hmm. responded to his lecture in that regard, and I mean, and part of my sense is that what he's moved out of the world of biology and and he's entered into the world of of philosophical theological discourse, and and he's done so it seems to me without. Uh, really uh, entering into dialogue with the great thinkers in those areas. I mean, he, he's putting forth a moral system, which first of all is very um, limited and circumscribed. I mean, I think you're about right in saying uh, th what the substance of the ethics he proposes is be nice and be fair. I mean, I'm not sure that there's a whole lot more than that. Don't have intercourse with your sister, but, uh, th you know, something like that. But I mean, it, it seems to miss to me much of what we take to be fully human. Uh, um, I know he's uh, influenced by Immanuel Kant and through uh, David Hume especially, but uh, Kant said there were three questions, what can we know and um, what ought we do? But he had a third question, what can we hope for? And, and it's that what can we hope for that, that sort of seems to me to be distinctively human. We've got the, this situation. One of the things that he says, we don't ascri uh, really aspire to be great like the saints, like Mother Teresa says things like that. And I, I find that, uh, that, as a matter of fact, a lot of people do dream about being better people. Woody Allen made a movie uh, on the whole premise that uh, an affluent woman really was influenced by the example of uh, Mother Teresa, that there was a dream that that set loose within her to live a life of service and renunciation that goes far beyond being nice. So that um, my criticism of Roos uh, is that, that his ethics is too thin, 
too narrow and that when he tries to defend it he defends it only on evolutionary grounds biological grounds and doesn't enter into dialogue with the great thinkers the great moralists of history i i think that uh you you had said earlier that that uh uh, one, one thing that bothered you is that you think when his idea of illusion is moving out of the realm of uh, of evolutionary biology and into the realm of, of uh, theology and philosophy. I tend to think it more moving into the realm of cognitive psychology, uh, in that 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 uh, it, it it more than any other ethical system that I can think of postulates that there might be some sort of brain mechanism that that one could that the cognitive psychologist might be able to identify is there this this uh, this illusionary aspect um the uh, word illusion is always filled generated. with i mean that takes us back to freud religion <laughs> the, you know the future of an illusion uh, that the word illusion's got meaning within the psychological literature it's got to do with well, perhaps they've changed the word and, yeah and, and it's got to do is. with wish fulfillment which is very much involved in all of this Ernie, um, you and I, whenever we talk, never have enough time to settle things like, like uh, as we would like to. And I'm sorry about that. But uh, we have been talking about uh, religion and biology and dialogue. We've been trying to talk about evolutionary ethics. You got your chance, I think, to explain what Michael Roos was about or something of what these people say, that there is an ought, that it's based uh, fundamentally on an illusion, I guess, that is programmed into us biologically. Uh, I want to say there's a larger picture here and that I want to say ethics is finally based on a call, not an illusion, but a call from the one who's running the world and <coughs> the one who we're responsible to, the one we call God, and that this God is building dreams and hopes in our heart to move not beyond just being nice and fair, but being uh, generous in our response and trying to indeed help other people.